Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm very excited to have this interview start for us today because I have the wonderful Evan Winter, the author of Rage of Dragons, still my favorite book of the year, and someone whose brain I'm very eager to pick apart and see just how he managed to craft such a good book right out the gate. First attempt. How's it going, Evan? Pretty good, and thank you very, very much for having me. It's an absolute honor to be here. Um, I love the channel and love the way you think and talk about books, so very excited to, to be chatting with someone who's, who loves books in that way. It always amazes me when someone who's like a published, established person has even heard of me, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, so I basically wanted to start off by hitting on one of my uh, biggest points that I hit on my review, where this book feels like it's written by someone who has a lot of experience with fantasy. And I wanted to know where that comes from. Do you know, like, okay, have you been just been reading it since you were a kid? Do you have, like, five not published books that you have under, like, just waiting to go out? Like, where did that voice come from, if you can give me any insight on that? Uh, well, thank you, first of all, very much. I'm glad it feels as if uh, I've been doing it for a while. <laughs> That's great. Um, no, I don't have any sort of trunk novels or anything else like that. I think that um, I have loved fantasy for, like, it's the first thing I started reading, like the, the Narnia books and everything that I've always read has kind of been speculative fiction into that science fiction and fantasy sort of world. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that comes through and that sort of like that knowledge from reading all of that stuff is just sitting in my brain. And then um, I guess I tried to pair that with a little bit of the way that I... I, I like and see the world in terms of story, um, love watching movies as well, worked in film for about 15 years, uh, but just primarily music videos. So I try to capture um, everything that I learned from working in that field and everything that I loved from reading books and sort of mash them into one thing. So if, if, if there's something that comes across in the books, maybe it's that and, uh, and hopefully it works. So. Well, are you are you able to pinpoint your biggest influences? Are there certain authors that you're just diehard fan for? Or are you just more of a anything and everything type reader? A bit of um, bit of anything and everything. I'm I'm willing to give almost anything a try and just to dive in and see how it goes. I think that um, Guy Gabriel K is sort of a a really interesting and powerful author that I I've enjoyed. Uh, reading very, very much, uh, and kind of sort of stepped up the game for the fantasy game for me in a lot of ways. Um, of course, of course, Robert Jordan and um, the overall sort of Wheel of Time series. I think that when I first read that, when I first when I read book one, and uh, you know, I was uh, you know, I was younger, a lot younger, living with my parents in the basement, my little bedroom, opening that book and just being dropped entirely into a whole new world, even from his prologue which is just that, you know, that monster prologue where the world's all already kind of been broken to pieces. I was like, what is this? And so, <laughs> you know, he had me from, from jump. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that going back to Rage of Dragons, that's something I definitely felt reflected in yours as well, where you have this prologue that feels, you know, us fantasy fans were a sucker for a big boom. We like to start with that boom and then transition into the you know wider world. And I really liked how you handled that, where a lot of times it can be very confusing to have just certain things be thrown at you. I find the prologue, I have the world rather confusing our first time through, but for years, it was a very natural transition and a way to set the stakes, man. <laughs> you definitely set Thank stakes well. <laughs> um, okay, so what are you, I have to ask everybody this, because it's a, it's a, what I've been, keep going here. What are you currently reading and what have you recently read that you really love? Okay, um, great questions. I think uh, right at the very moment, I'm reading um, Jade City by Fonda Lee, and okay. I'm also um, getting through the beginning of James Islington's uh, Lycanius trilogy. Um, so enjoying very much both of those. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of what else I've read very recently. Um, it's a bit it's a bit tough because I'm I just finished my sort of first draft of uh, book two. And I'm now doing edits and revisions on book two. <laughs> and so the funny thing about this is I'm, I'm, actually in a pro, I'm actually in a place where I'm getting tons of books sent to me, which is like a dream come true. And yet I'm finding myself with less time to read than ever before in my life. So and, I'm, and strangely, or maybe not strangely, I, I'm also, I guess, kind of a slow reader. I, I, I look at people like you and, and other sort of like bloggers or reviewers, and they power through books. Like they just go through them like crazy. And I'm, how are you, how are you doing that? Like, <laughs> I, I guess I'm just a bit slower. 
um, regimenting your reading and lots of note taking pretty much kill the joy of reading and you can burn a lot faster. <laughs> I hear you on that. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I still, I still love reading. Um, and I actually, it's funny you say that because I find I'm also one very happy you were able to say, Oh, this, this, that, like, or, or what I've read recently love. Cause a lot of people I ask that who are fantasy authors and like, I just can't read anymore. And it makes me sad. I'm like, Oh no. Oh, yeah. So glad to hear you're still cranking through them. Um, but Recently, especially, I've noticed um, in fantasy, there's there's a lot. I mean, we're in the self-publishing boom, which you're a part of, and you mm-hmm. seem to yep. be not caught in the wave. You're writing it very well, um, but we're seeing this influx of more original ideas, different takes on fantasy, really growing it. Um, and if, so, you are one of the prime examples of that, in my opinion, where Rage of Dragons felt different. This felt like it was coming from a new perspective. Um, well, there definitely are still the tinges of Tolkien. There's all kinds of stuff coming in from your book. And you mentioned earlier pulling from the real world, your experiences, your experience with media. And then you also have been quoted several times saying you wanted to write something for your kid, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm just wondering how all those things came together and at what age you're going to let your kid actually read it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, then, yeah, I think that, um, my little guy is currently about to turn, he's just about to turn eight. He turns eight in October. Okay. And so it's probably a little too early so far. And yeah. uh, he's an amazing reader. Like he's he's read around 50 books so far this uh, this year, I think it's been. He finished Harry Potter this year. He's, got, he's um, gotten through almost, he's on the last book of the main sort of Percy Jackson series. And he oh, started okay. those just a couple months ago. So he's an, a crazy reader and, and way reading me under the table. So that's awesome <laughs> and amazing to see. Um, and... So he could read, he, like he's capable of reading the Rage of Dragons from a technical standpoint, but mm-hmm. obviously the topics, the themes are a bit maybe too much. So I think that probably when he's around uh, 12 or so, uh, which is maybe a little younger than it, I would be comfortable saying for most other parents, like everyone has to choose for themselves. But right. I'd, I'd probably say, OK, give it a go if you want to when he's about mm-hmm. 12. Uh, and he's he's asked me, when can I read this? When can I read this? So I'm looking forward to the day when he tries it and then tells me, oh, this isn't that good. Something like that. <laughs> Um, so when it comes to, you know, your experiences uh, pulling into this book, though, as well, I mean, I've looked into your background a little bit. I have to stalk people to interview them, people. It's, it's what you do. Um, so you've moved around quite a bit. You, A man of the world is the way to put it. Um, <laughs> and it's I think that reflects in your writing quite a bit. Was that conscious or is that just, you know, you pulled from what you knew and it just happened that way? I think that... Um... I think it's kind of a, a pull from what I what I knew, um, mm-hmm. and I was really interested in in writing this to try and get um, as much of the way I see the world out into the story, uh, the issues that I have that I see with the world, the problems, and some of the joyful and wonderful things about just living life. Uh, so I tried to pour as much of myself into the book. I tried to pour as much of my concerns into the book, and then it's it's meant to be an exploration of like everything that sort of swirls around in my head about okay. just what it means to live life and ha- and just exist through the human condition. And I think my goal is not to ever try to answer the questions I have because I don't have any of the answers, but it's just to ask the questions and then to try and examine them and hope that um, people who read the book find that examination um, interesting as well. Because I find uh, exploring all of the themes and issues that are that happen in The Rage of Dragons and are meant to happen in the rest of the series uh, are very sort of interesting. So, you know, a lot of the book is sort of Timely as well in the sense, I mean, for me at least, in the sense of uh, the current political atmosphere, um, you know, the, the sort of the way the world feels to me right now. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm trying to step back and sort of examine all of that um, from a slight remove, uh, which which the sec- having the secondary world and all that sort of fantasy element things, that all helps to do that, I think, for me at least. But it's really just me trying to understand the world and life a little bit better by asking questions that I do not have the answers to. Well, that's... That's a great approach, and I like you hearing you say you're not trying to answer them because a lot of the times I feel like it's it's great to have your ideas reflected in your writing. I love that. I want an author to have something to say, but it's when an author kind of comes through and says, "And here's the answer," that I'm like, "Do you know that yeah. though?" <laughs> yeah, no, I do not know the answers. <laughs> so one of the you said you know you're pulling from your life, real world, but one of the major themes that's in the forefront of Rage of Dragons is rage, anger, the inability to forgive, to get over things like that. Um, that is such a strong emotion 
to tackle. I mean, that is one of the big things that I think every adult goes through is whether or not they can learn to forgive, um, you know, where, how they learn to do that, whether it's through just growing as a person, religion, what have you. Um, where did you look to find examples of that kind of obsessive rage, that inability to forgive? Because it, it came through the pages powerfully. Thank you. Um, for me, it's, yeah, it's about the individual need to sort of protect what you love, protect family, protect friends, found family or blood family. And then also to look at that, the issue of when, when things are done to you, things are done to those people you love, how do you react? Mm -hmm. And then sort of exact, taking a, a look at the world around us and also a bit of history and saying that the, the way we tend to react to societies and as cultures is to try to retaliate a lot of the time. And then what does that lead to? And so a lot of the Rage of Dragons and the rest of the series does try to ask questions around both violence and cycles of violence. And how do we break out of those cycles of violence? Is that possible? Um, and if it's possible, what are the ways that we do that? And it's, yeah, so I think that for me, it was really about taking a look at that and sort of saying, well, you know, when do you turn the other cheek and, uh, and when do you not? And, uh, you know, what is the sort of the moral value of, of, of either of those choices um, and sort of the outcomes of those choices? So really, a lot of that was what I was trying to look at, because, again, a, a quick trip through human history leads you to see many injustices, uh, you know, uh, many sort of actions that have, have served to oppress or uh, deny others, other societies or cultures equal humanity. Mm -hmm. And, you know. How do we break out of that cycle? Can it be done without violence? If violence becomes necessary, what does that look like? And again, what are the outcomes? What does that mean for the people who enact the violence? And, the, and what does it mean for the people upon whom that violence is enacted? So trying to sort of ask a lot of those questions. How do we break out and become better? They're, they're, they're hefty questions. And it could have led to a much, I feel like, I, I feel, I, I am I personally a bit, tired of the overly grim dark fantasy which mm. luckily that wave seems to be dying out and i like how rage of dragons seem to be willing to go to darker places but you don't spend paragraphs and pages describing awful horrible gruesome things you know there's there's that i, I appreciate that thanks um, no, no worries. Uh, but when it comes to you know you don't need to pull from history to see examples of stuff like that because it's happening today it's happening now turn on a headline um and it, it, so with you, what you're saying here of you know these looking at history, looking at current events of how anger and turning the other cheek can happen. Is there any particular events you dived in deeper to? Because I know a lot of fantasy authors, we're big history nerds too. They kind of go hand in hand. Um, so is there any specific events that you really dove into to explore? Um, I mean, I think I was trying to take a little bit from everywhere. Uh, okay. Obvious, uh, perhaps sort of obviously, I am taking a look at sort of Africa and its colonial history, the history there, uh, and the history of the oppression of a lot of people from Africa. Um, so that is probably the most, um, the, the largest influence in terms of the, the overall writing and the, and the message I'm trying to get across. But at the end of the day, I think that my goal is to try and um, abstract enough that what I'm doing, hopefully, is taking what seems to be patterns in human behavior, and then trying to ask questions about why those patterns seem to consistently emerge. And is there a way out of those patterns or are those patterns part of, of who we seem to be? Um, and in terms of even Grimdark and sort of, sort of segueing between the two questions, <clears throat> with Grimdark, I guess one of the core ideas, or at least it seems to me that one of the core ideas is that humans are kind of just bastards. Like that's just, that's our base setting. And I guess, <clears throat> I don't, I, I don't think that's the way we are as a base setting. I think that human beings in general, we are like, <clears throat> excuse me, we are like wolves or dogs in the sense that we're pack animals. Like society doesn't work and cannot work. Um, we cannot live together and, and not just be murdering each other uh, willy nilly, like on the steady, if we weren't inclined to work together and try to do better for one another. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, so that's my base setting is that you know, if, if we're going to start with the how are we born, I think humans are born good. That's my base setting. And so if, if that's my base setting, then why do bad things happen? And so that's sort of the questions I'm trying to ask. Like, where, do the, where, does, the bad, or where does the bad arise from? Where does it come from? Why, why are we willing at a certain point to hurt one another uh, mm -hmm. if we are probably inherently born inclined to cooperate and care for one another? And so that's a lot of what I, I'm sort of uh, curious about as well. 
It's very refreshing to hear someone be so optimistic, man. I love hearing that. <laughs> uh, I, I largely agree with you. I'm generally a believer that people are good and that evil stems from, you know, other things, outside influences. Uh, but it, it it's fascinating to see someone trying to explore these ideas from that angle, because I, I'm currently writing in my general thesis is to explore the ideas of manifest destiny and how it resulted in such atrocities. I mean, you know, people believing we have the right to own everything results in a whole lot of bloodshed and a whole mm-hmm. lot of death. Yep. Um, it's And so, you know, and people still think those ideas are dead when they're not. I mean, they're still prevalence. People still, I mean, very much I, so. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's great to see a work like Rage of Dragons come out of that. It's, it's almost makes Rage of Dragons, this med- this meditation on our <laughs> on our psyche, and it's great. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, that's <clears throat> that's part of what I'm trying to do, I guess, is I, I am asked. I have these questions, and I want to ask them. And at the same time, I want to tell a story that would uh, at least compel me to keep the pages turning, and uh, not to turn the tables on you at all. But I found it very interesting that you just said the word thesis in terms of what you're actually writing. That's t- that's how I tend to think of it too. I tend to think of it as there's a, th- a central thesis to what I'm trying to do. So what made you do that? Most people talk about writing in terms of themes or uh, you know or just plot or, or or characters. You use the word thesis. Why is that? Because it's how my brain is wired. Ah, fair <laughs> I, okay. The way I explore topics is I have to ask a question first. Mm-hmm. I have to have this. Okay. How can we answer this? And let's try to. We're going to fail probably, but let's mm-hmm. do our best. Let's at least learn something along the way. And I'm not changing that for my writing. I mean, that's how I even go into reviews. Mm-hmm. I go into a book with what was this book trying to say? What's its point? And then let's try and expand on it from there. You know, I've, I've had great examples from stuff like that where, you know, I, you know, there's there's books that have. I'm still not entirely sure what they're saying, but they're definitely saying something like, I'm not sure what Brandon Sanders is trying to say with the Stormlight Archive yet. It's it's mm-hmm. huge, epic, grand fantasy. There's a lot about mental illness in there so far. Yeah. Um, there's a lot about fighting the demons of your past. Um, but we're only three books in, so I'm not going to claim I know, you know how I'm going to judge the whole series. But I can go book by book and say, okay, book one seems to be very focused on depression. Uh, book mm-hmm. three seems to be dealing a lot with anger and getting over your demons of your past. You know, you know, and I, can, I can go each review... And say, okay, how well did he examine that topic? And that's what I did with Rage of Dragons. I mean, yours is your thesis. It came across very clearly, and I think that's because we both kind of think the yeah. same way. And it made it very digestible. And I, I like what you had to say. I don't know if I'm quite as optimistic. I think I'm <laughs> one step down. <laughs> But no, I, I like that. Yeah, I think the exact same way. And that's funny. I've never heard. I don't think I've heard anybody else talk about writing in terms of like thesis. Mm-hmm. And so when you said that word, yeah, that is how I do it. And that's literally in my first outline. And I actually have thesis and like, and then I have you know, a little <laughs> colon and then I write my little thesis and what I think I'm trying to the question I think I'm trying to ask. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And is that a thesis that's going to continue to the end? Or is it OK, now book two, we're readjusting, resetting ourselves. Here's a new thesis. Let's continue this same storyline. If you, if you feel I, comfortable answering, I don't want to get spoilers or anything like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, no worries. I think that I kind of have a bit of both. Like, I have sort of a, a meta thesis that's sort of the, the big question um, that I'm trying to ask. And then each book has its own kind of um, uh, sort of sub thesis that comes out of where the story has progressed, where the story is going, and what the characters have to primarily face or deal with in that, in that story. So, yeah, I think I have a sort of an overarching thesis or, again, just theme, as I guess a lot of people would say. And then within each book there, I'm exploring something kind of like what you how you just described what, what you see in Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight. Right. Yeah. right? Um, each book has kind of a, a topic, a specific topic that it seems to be trying to tackle. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there's a wider overarching theme in each mm-hmm. book is this entry, this question into it that you can examine as a thesis. And that's that's beautiful. I love that. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are just like, I like the books. <laughs> so that's also <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, so uh, that actually transitions. I have a couple other things here I wanted to briefly touch on. Um, so you, I, I, I saw a comment on my review recently that I wholeheartedly agree with. And it's the only glaring issue with Rage of Dragons is the rest of the series is not out yet. <laughs> <laughs> and you ha- you said you have the second first draft done. I don't know if that's news for people, but hey, if that's breaking here, awesome. Yeah, sweet. Uh, <laughs> uh, so how is the writing process going so far for book two? Have you been able to just, okay, here's where I want to go, or has it been more difficult now? I mean, how is it diving back in now that you have a very big hit first success? Oh, um, thank you for saying that. And uh, yeah, I think for me, I outline extensively. So um, 
my outlines are about 20% of the final book. So the books have been like book one was about 500 and some odd pages. So the outline for that was about a hundred pages. And then I did the same with book two, the outlines about a hundred pages. So I feel very comfortable when I go into drafting. Um, and so doing draft two was, it was interesting because everyone always says book twos are incredibly hard. And I, and even with that solid, solid outline that makes me feel very comfortable that I know where I'm trying to go. Um, it still was difficult to, to, to sort of get book two done, I guess, because there are levels of expectation. There's even something as simple as a, a, a contracted due date for when the book is done. This needs to be done and handed into um, orbit. So it, that changes the way it feels to be doing the work itself. Um, but I think I was very happy with the way that the first draft came out. Uh, I, I feel as if I'm doing what I wanted to do from the outline and from, you know, the. it was really cool to hit the scenes that I'd been thinking about for about a year. The big sort of like set piece scenes that I was like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to get this person to say this to this person in this moment. And when I got to those parts, I still, I, I, it was thrilling for me. So I feel very excited about where I am and I'm excited to go back in now um, after having received uh, some really great notes from my editor to sort of just not change very much, but just get in there and dig deeper because uh, uh, where the book is now is you can read it from beginning to end and it's all there and it's a story. But now I want to get deeper into the themes and into the characters and sort of really flesh out who everybody is, why they're doing what they're doing and why things are happening. And mm. hopefully sort of just go deeper and deeper and deeper with each subsequent draft and pass so that by the time it gets out uh, next July or uh, yeah, next summer, I should really say 2020, um, hopefully it's as good as I can possibly make it. And hopefully that's good enough. And do you struggle? In the, I've heard many authors say one of their biggest struggles in saying, OK, I'm, I'm done. I can walk away. Or are you one of these people who just wants to go through again and again and again? <laughs> I think I, I think I am. I think I am because um, I know there's a bit um, it would be nice for Orbit to sort of say, well, let's, you know, let's wrap this up in a reasonable amount of time so that we can get um, hit our publication dates and be very comfortable with everything. And, um, you know, I was a bit slow um, getting the initial draft into them. Right. So, and by a little bit slow, I mean, I blew through my deadline. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, you know, so now I need to move a little bit faster um, in order to make sure that I'm not sort of really sort of jamming everybody else at the end when they have to do all the stuff that they have to do, because there's a lot of other things that have to happen beyond just me writing the words. Um, but I do want to keep going in because I feel like every time I go back in, I can make things feel a little bit more whole, a little bit more uh, fully formed. Um, so the way I kind of think of it is in the first draft, I'm, I'm just writing the words. And then in the second draft, I'm trying to write the, I'm trying to say the words well. And in the mm-hmm. third draft, I'm not just trying to say them well, I'm trying to actually make sure that what I'm saying is exactly what I want to say, you know? Mm-hmm. So that deeper I, level, I really that, enjoy, yeah. yeah. And every single, and you, so it's really hard to walk away. It is because I, you keep feeling like I can keep going in, in here. And some people say they get to a point where they worry that they're not making it better. Um, I think that with each draft, I, I do feel like I can make it something more that I like than something that I would love even more because I'm not going to change a word or a sentence and have it be something that I like less. You know what I mean? Like as, from just a, a craft perspective, when I'm sitting there and putting in time and effort, um, I guess I kind of think of the, the craft of writing almost, let's pretend I'm a plumber or something. Mm-hmm. Um, the more I work on the plumbing, I'm probably, if I have some level of craft or, or knowledge about what I'm trying to achieve, I'm probably not going to make it worse. Mm-hmm. And sure, at, at a certain point, you do have to just walk away because they're diminishing returns. But it, it is hard to do that because I can't tell how diminishing the returns are, but I do feel like I can make it just a bit better if I try. Interesting, interesting. And you did... Uh, make one of the transitions while we're talking about this that not everyone does make where you started self-published and now mm-hmm. you are working with Orbit. And from everything I've seen you say online, it's been a great experience. Um, I've worked been. with Orbit a little bit uh, in terms of them sending me books and things, and they've been fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, so is that, I mean, you just said your editor makes great notes. So has that just been smooth for you? You're very happy with where you've been? And tr- you, do you recommend, okay, start self-publishing, get some leverage, and then dive on into a publisher mm-hmm. after you get your story out there? <laughs> you know what? Um, <coughs> excuse me. I guess I would. I guess I would recommend it that way because uh, for, it felt really smooth and really good to me to have come from that from that sort of path um, mm-hmm. because I didn't have to query agents. Um, and I didn't have to sort of go looking. I didn't do any of that. And mm-hmm. it made it... I don't know how it feels the other way around, but because I did it that way, it does very much feel like I, I was offered an opportunity to get the story out in the way I wanted to get it out. And then to have people say, well, we think what you're doing is interesting and we'd like to offer our help if you're interested in that. 
and and that was sort of to have it to have the whole traditional publishing sort of system come at to come at it that way was very interesting because then I go okay yeah I would love that help I would love to you know have people who do this day in and day out um, you know help me try to create make the craft better uh, help try to d tell the story to more people than I would probably have been able to on my own. So the journey has felt very smooth so far. Um, the people at Orbit have been absolutely wonderful. Like it was easy for me to feel before I'd met anyone that um, they are gatekeepers and that they primarily, you know, want to get in there and then change what you've done. Um, and it has not felt that way at all. The, uh, the Orbit team from um, editorial to marketing to all the administration have really felt like fans of the genre who are excited about the story and want to make it be the very best it can be by helping me. So, um, yeah, very, very excited to continue working with them. And it has been very smooth so far. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here. This is the smooth way to interview someone is to just blatantly look no. down and read. No <laughs> <laughs> um, you had this explosion on Reddit. It's where I first heard about you. Oh, cool. Where you, you know, there's Reddit post after Reddit post asking people, is it as good as people say? And then almost all the comments are, yeah, it's great. Um, and then you've done an AMA there. I mean, how d did that just like wake up and happen one day where you saw like, oh, people on Reddit are talking about the book? I mean, how did that feel? I mean, that's got to be strange to be going self-published and then suddenly, oh, this community in r slash fantasy that I have, you know, never really, you know, it's just all of a sudden it's there. You didn't pay for it or anything. It's just that is people's legitimate opinions. Yeah, no, um, our fantasy has been absolutely amazing. Um, and what happened, the way it all started, I was self-published and I literally on launch day made a post on a, a couple subreddits, primarily our fantasy because I'd been lurking there for years and years. Mm -hmm. And I also made a post on Facebook to like my Facebook friends. Um, and because I, I didn't know exactly where else to go. And I was like, you know what? Uh, I've always enjoyed visiting our fantasy. I think I've written something that at least hopefully some of them would enjoy. Let me tell this community that I go to almost every single day just to do my random endless scroll. Let me go and tell them that I've done this thing. And um, yeah, they really sort of championed it and helped it climb the charts on that first day. And that gave it that gave the Rage of Dragons a massive, massive head start and a boost that uh, allowed it to sort of continue and uh, make sales and sort of get into the hands of, of, of readers. So it was incredible to, uh, you know, feel that I was embraced by a lot of the, the community on our, on our fantasy. And it has been very strange, I'm not going to lie, because I still go there just to scroll for, like, relaxation, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, uh, I'm lying in bed or whatever, and I'm just like, I'm just going to go scroll. And then every once in a while, I'll run across somebody saying something about, you know, one time I ran, I was scrolling, and I came across my face because somebody had put, you know, taken <laughs> one of the promotion shots. And I'm just going, I'm like, whoa. And it's it's very strange. Like, that was a super odd moment and feeling because it's a place I go to chill and then it kind of like throws the work world back into your face a little bit. So, yeah. I, uh, one of my biggest, uh, I saw one of my biggest, like, oh, that's awesome, is I saw uh, fan art for Rage of Dragons. And I was like, that's when you know you've made it. When fan art for Rage of Dragons is being posted and uploaded, right. you got it. You got it there. <laughs> oh, my God. No, no. Fan art is, like, I mean, that's a whole other thing. And I've, I've not really gotten, like, that hasn't really happened very much at all yet. But yeah, I see other authors in there, you know, people who are, artists are sitting there taking their time to make art from their words. Yeah, that's that feels amazing. And that is so, so crazy. I, I don't know if you've caught it, but I've seen some for Rage of Dragons. If you haven't, if it hasn't been on your radar. I will send it your way. <laughs> oh, please, please do. That would be awesome. Yeah, please All do. Right. Um, so I have to ask from the uh, more analytical side of the channel here, knowing what's happening with the genre. Every day, new fantasy series are being adapted into mm -hmm. movies. Is, have you been approached? Is that a possibility? Are you interested in Rage of Dragons becoming a blockbuster someday? I think it would be very, very hard not to be interested in that. I think that, uh, <laughs> Maybe a dumb question, yeah. No, no, but you know what? Some people maybe aren't, but I guess I am. I came, my background kind of is in film. My original plan was I want to direct movies, uh, you know what I mean? And so I got into music videos and I was directing and a cinematographer there and I had a blast and loved it. And I still was trying to get to the point where I could do movies. Mm -hmm. And I talked to one of my best friends and uh, and he said, he gave me some advice and it sort of changed the way I, view, I thought about the whole path that I was on. He said, take a look at the very top people in your field. Okay, look at them and think to yourself, how happy would I be if I had their life? 
not necessarily the work, but their life. And so I thought about it and I thought, and at the time I was thinking, okay, well, you know, there's Lord of the Rings and Peter Jackson kind of thing. And, you know, it's an amazing life. It's an amazing world that he gets to live. Then you, you watch the behind the scenes and he has to be away from maybe home and family for years at a time. It's still, even when you're that huge Spielberg, the other day I read an article and this was like maybe a year ago, he was looking for financing for his next film. And this is Spielberg. And so you, you, you look at that and you go, away from the family for a whole bunch of time. The majority of your time isn't actually making movies. It's either trying to market them or raise the financing for them. And I, I don't know that I, I don't know that that was the life I wanted for myself. And I'd always, I always have loved writing. And as a music video director, we write the ideas for the videos. Like you write, they're called treatments. You write the treatment. And so that's sort of the script for the music video. And that was sort of my favorite part, one of my favorite parts of the process. And I was like, maybe I need to dive a little deeper into the writing aspect because that would be, you know, more fun and and, and more fulfilling for me. Um, and so to more directly answer your question, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have amazing agents, um, and uh, you know what? We have been approached already, uh, and uh, and so you know, we're, you know, I guess those discussions are, are happening or whatever have you. Um, but yeah, no, people are approaching, so it's 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 incredibly exciting for every single one of the calls that we that I that I get on or or to hear the conversations from the agents that oh, so and so has had interest. Um, and the most uh, perhaps the craziest part is that. The modern world feels very different because of social media and everything. Mm -hmm. There are actually people um, straight out of Hollywood who sometimes the easiest way to get a hold of me is they just reach out through Facebook or even through Twitter. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, you know what? Could we just have a chat? And so that's pretty crazy, too, that where there used to be sort of that very sort of strong wall of everything has to come through the agent. Now people can kind of get a hold of you directly. And then you sort of put, you know, you, you, ha you have to kind of go into the whole system and agents talk and all that. But, yeah, that's been interesting as well to see. Prime example, I met you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, yeah, exactly yeah. that. Uh, I would have never had the guts to reach out for an interview if I couldn't just send you a private message and be like, hey, you, you want to come on the channel? <laughs> oh, and, and that's the most amazing thing about all this is that from readers to bloggers to reviewers to everybody, to other creatives, right, we can all kind of reach out and just have a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. I just did a panel with Fonda Lee and Nicholas Eames, both brilliant writers, and I, I was uh, kind of like, you know, friends with them uh, online on Twitter before I even got a chance to meet them. And before our panels, we went out for lunch. And again, that's also a very strange feeling to walk into a room and see two people who you kind of feel like you know, and you recognize their faces because you're seeing their faces like you know hundreds of times, but you don't actually know them, and you have to sit down and introduce yourself. But yeah, it's it, the modern world is a, is a pretty strange place with all of this. Yeah, yeah, man. It's I didn't expect this to transition into a social media is crazy conversation, but it's a great and it's topical. I mean, yeah, I mean, the the fantasy genre is changing drastically because of Hollywood and social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, suddenly your your words will follow you for better or worse, and uh, yep. Hollywood will come knocking, it seems, uh, no matter what. And I can say, if anyone from Hollywood's listening, I think Rage of Dragons is incredibly cinematic, would be a great movie or TV show or whatever your studio thinks would be great. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know yeah. they are listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you had a, a new cover as well for Rage of Dragons, mm. the edition I have. I thought I got the first edition. Turns out, no, I got the I got the Orbit edition. <laughs> Did, how much uh, creative input were you allowed to have for the cover there? Um, you, what happened is that um, they they hired an amazing artist, uh, Carlo Ortiz, who mm -hmm. is absolutely brilliant, does a ton of work for uh, Marvel, um, ILM, and just if you go to her website and you, and you scroll through the work she does and sort of her uh, pr her personal work and her professional, I mean, well, it's all professional, but her personal work and her sort of a commissioned work, it's, uh, you go, oh my goodness, like who is fortunate enough to be able to work with this person? And Orbit got her and she did my cover and I feel very, very, very fortunate for that. Um, in terms of input, they sort of had a bunch of ideas and showed me some mock-ups and then asked me, well, what do you think? And I actually got to say some stuff like, oh, these colors feel a bit more African to me, or, or at least mm -hmm. to me, because I grew up in Zambia. And so some of the colors um, in the some of the very early drafts, I was like, you know what, maybe if we if you thought about some of this as well. And it was a very sort of collaborative in that sense, and that they were happy to listen and take that input. Mm -hmm. And I'm making it sound like I had a lot of input. And I didn't because I didn't need to like what they sent over was brilliant, basically, from the start. And I and I could feel I felt like I understood what they were what, what they were trying to do and what they were doing. And it also feels like a great representation of the actual uh, book itself. So, yeah. I, I kind of understand what you're talking about because I've definitely I've had people show me art and it's just like that's on a level so much higher than I could even think of. Yeah. That's just yeah. like, yeah, that's amazing. Good job. <laughs> um, exactly. 
And I still love the original cover, though. I've seen that as well. Um, and, there, man, there are a lot of bad covers out there. So for you to get two in a row <laughs> that are good, congrats. No, thank you. And the uh, self-published cover, I mean, it's also a different thing that I think you're doing when you're trying to self-publish versus actually uh, what Orbit has to do as a traditional publisher. Mm -hmm. Orbit is, is very concerned, and rightfully so, with well, what does the book feel like and look like when it's sitting on a store shelf? Mm -hmm. And when you're self-publishing and, you know, I had to do I had to try and figure my way through that. I'm very concerned about, well, what does it look like and feel like when you're looking at a thumbnail? Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, from a thumbnail, uh, you know, when you're when someone's just scrolling through Amazon looking for a book and all they're going to really see before they click through is that thumbnail. Um, I wanted something that felt very much very, very sort of like on brand for epic fantasy with the big dragon and fire coming out and people being decimated by that fire and, and that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's interesting because the, the jobs are the same, but also the goals are very different, I think, when a traditional publisher has to tackle a cover versus a self-published author has to tackle a cover and hopefully appeal to people who are primarily and almost only going to see it online. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's interesting. I've uh, across the board now heard authors like fans. We have this perspective where. You know, publishers are evil shadow organizations that are going to ruin your cover and change your book and all this stuff. But the more I've talked with people like you, the more I've read things from big authors like Brandon, the more mm -hmm. I've, you know, all these people, everyone says, like, it's pretty great. Yeah, they have different goals, but mm -hmm. everyone wants to get this book in as many hands as possible. So it's, you know, no one's out there evilly twirling a mustache trying to yep. sabotage your artwork. Um, so my, my perspective on that has been changed because I was guilty of back in the day thinking like, you know, that that's not the way to go. Um, no, not everyone needs to go the, the self-published route, it seems. So thank you for helping me learn. <laughs> no, no worries. And you know what? I've also, because I started with self-publishing, I've, I've met um, a lot of authors who are self-published and very successfully so. Mm -hmm. And I do, I feel like it's important. I mean, the message is getting out there, but I do feel like it's important to acknowledge, Like, and you are, but it's important to sort of for me to keep acknowledging that self-publishing is a very, very, very viable and mm -hmm. completely a uh, reasonable way to go about publishing, getting your words out there and having readers get a hold of your story. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it's it's a great avenue where a time in history where it's never been better. It's never been better to be sort of a, a creator in this kind of way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I look at your channel and you've got like 65,000 subscribers who sort of come here and listen to you talk about fantasy. And, you know, you know, it's just it's incredible. Right. Mm -hmm. Like and when in history have we been able to do this kind of a thing where. I mean, not even just recently, the most we had was like newspaper articles written by, you know, or, or maybe a TV show with like Ebert and Roper in terms of like, yeah. movies. that would be the biggest. But now it's and there, I'm not gonna lie, there's a part of me that feels a bit like I'm just a guy. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> these people are tuning in. I'm just a guy who has a camera and a mic and I say my opinions. But the more I've done this, the more I've realized that's what everybody is. And it's yeah. just your varying level of experience. You'll get better. I mean, that's I mean, yeah, it. If anyone's going to take away anything from this motivational last conversation Evan and I are having, <laughs> it's to just try what you want to try. Yep. Don't let people tell you you can't because, you know, what's the worst that happens? You fail, and that's not that big yeah, a deal. Not that big a deal. And even to go, I was talking to somebody about this uh, the other day. I play League of Legends uh, maybe a little <laughs> bit too much, but it's funny because <laughs> one of the things I actually do for just uh, like over my lunch break when I, you know, between writing, I'm like, oh, it's time to eat lunch. My hands are busy. I'll throw on like a, um, a YouTuber or something or a Twitch streamer and watch them play that video game. And I'll do it and enjoy it with the same amount of excitement as I would another episode of TV. And so it's, it, we're in an interesting place even for entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. And for just content uh, where, and I'll do the same with you. I'll just, you know, I get the alerts uh, that pop up on my desktop and they go, oh, Daniel's got a new thing up and I'll just click on that and I'll sit there and again, I'm eating and I'll just watch you, watch you work, right? And I'm being entertained in the same way as if uh, I threw up an episode of, you know, Dark Crystal or something, or or just because it's sort of topical, Downton Abbey or whatever, right? <laughs> right. I'm entertained in much the same way. So it's a, it's it's a, it's an interesting and wonderful world that we have, where content has come to mean, and entertainment has come to mean so many different things. Yeah, I mean, it's weird. I've had so many people tell me that I'm an entertainer, and I have never once thought of myself that way. I don't, but I I understand I am, especially with all the jokes and edits <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that's what I, I have to think of myself as now i mean you are too as well without a doubt i mean you are putting out uh i'd love to i, I i'm so excited to see where rage of dragons and this series goes um that there's i see nothing but big things ahead of you because i i mean i've already gotten comments are telling me i'm too gushing over this series but i'm just pumped <laughs> it's gonna be great i can feel it in my bones there's something special you've made here and i'm, I'm pumped to see where it goes <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you know what? It's uh, I hope not to let anybody down, and uh, you know, I, I hope that I can maintain the love uh, that I've gotten because uh, it's been. Uh, I don't want to use the word overwhelming, but it has been absolutely wonderful to see people connect the story and enjoy it. Um, and it's even been wonderful to see uh, the people who dislike it. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that for a little bit. It's sure. uh, the negative reviews. Um, a lot of the time, writers talk about how painful they are, and they can be painful, but. <laughs> It's for almost all the people who've said negative things, I sort of find myself looking at the negative review and sort of nodding along and going, yeah, I can see that. I can see that that if if that's if you're not looking for a certain thing in the book or you are looking for a certain thing, you're not finding it. And I kind of go, yeah, I see that. And, you know, I'm, I try to step back and be a reader and I'm like, yeah, I get your point. And then I kind of get annoyed at myself. Wait a second. I shouldn't be getting your point. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's but, a, yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a great quote by Ryan Johnson, who is, you know, a controversial creator in his own right right now where he said i don't want to make something that everyone goes yeah that was good i want to make yeah. something where people love it or they hate it and that's where i know i've made something very different um and i, I can tell you you got one love it here and <laughs> i haven't seen much uh hate for rage of dragons um, but i've definitely seen a lot of emotions pulled from people when discussing it um and again i, I think your theming and your thesis is <laughs> that's the way to say that uh, have been really well executed and conveyed um, which is different. I mean, I don't see many fantasy stories out there right now where I'm getting like, especially with this self-publishing wave, where I feel like someone is really trying to explore the way you are. So I explore an idea as effectively, and I appreciate that. That's why I've always, you know, I'm, I'm kicking a dead horse when I say this, but something I've been saying forever is I want to feel like the author is telling me something, is trying to convey something, explore an idea, and I'm learning or at least getting a different perspective um, while going into a book. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think we're in complete agreement there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I that's pretty much everything I had here I wanted to get through. I uh, appreciate you so much coming on the channel, man. Thank you extremely much for having me. Uh, you know what? I love the channel, and I've started t telling everybody you've got to check out uh, this <laughs> incredible channel if you want to know more about fantasy and uh, reviews and just how to do that job well. So thank you for the content. Thank you for entertaining me on my lunch hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that's what I'm able to do in life, I'm very happy with it. Um, but that's that's the number one thing I want authors to be able to do with my channel is not always agree with me, but at least know this is the reviewer, the fan perspective. This is where we're coming from. This is what I'm feeling because I am well aware that I'm in a position where I have my pulse on the fantasy community in a very real <laughs> effective way. Um, so that's that's something I want to get out there as much as possible is, you know, if you're an author, watch what I have to say in Dear Authors, watch what I have to say in this stuff because I'm pulling largely from what I'm reading in all these threads, comment sections, and hate mail I get. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you getting hate mail? <laughs> oh, yeah, there's, there's crazy people on the internet. That's all I can Gosh. say to that. <laughs> I will say, never go on record saying you hate anime because the backlash you will get oh. will be... Oh. oh, and I don't hate it. I misspoke. I like it. There's certain oh, things oh. I have brought that I've liked, but man... Oh man, <laughs> they're <Okay>. fans passionate. <laughs> noted and uh, you know very well considered. Okay, noted on that. Jeez. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. There will be a link to buy Rage of Dragons in the description down below, as well as the pinned comment. I highly recommend you check it out. It's already the most purchased book through any of my affiliate links ever. So thank you all for doing that. I didn't. Yeah, that's news for you. Probably realize I probably should have told you that. Yeah. Um, thank and thank you guys so much for tuning on, and thank you Evan for being here. Thank you very much for doing this. Appreciate it. All right.